Exodus 19, that's where we're going to be today, folks. You got a Bible, get them open. Exodus 19. I want you to picture for a moment the, uh, the whole group in this room, all, every one of us, uh, in an actual wilderness, an actual wilderness, a literal, physical wilderness. Let's, let's say it's hundreds of thousands of square miles, let's say the size of Texas, Alaska, whichever one you want to do. Now, we would do everything we can to get out, I'm sure. We would write messages in the dirt. We'd send up signal fires. We'd scream. We'd walk. We'd run. We'd hike. But what would we do if after months or years of failed attempts to navigate our way out, we come to the realization that we're not getting out? We're not getting out. The wilderness is where we will be the rest of our lives. Attempts to flee are futile. How would our thinking processes change? I would imagine that instead of strategizing an escape, we'd start strategizing for long-term survival. I'm sure that would be on our list. But I also think something deeper would settle in. If we're not escaping this, if what's around us is our life and there is no life outside it, what are we supposed to do and who are we supposed to be? Because you can't tether the answer to those two questions to something outside the wilderness. That's not happening. The extent of your existence is now in the wilderness. You cannot conceive of a life outside it. Christian, your entire life is lived this way. And guess what? You won't get out until Jesus calls you home. You won't and can't escape until then. So what are you supposed to do? And who are you supposed to be? The Lord knew that Israel faced the same fate. Many years of Wandering the wilderness and looking backwards, he knew they had no hope of escape. But God equips them with an incredibly deep sense of identity that is meant to anchor them to something transcendent. And I think that word for them then is a word for us today. God has provided for us in Exodus 19 a deep sense of identity that is meant to anchor us you, me, to something transcendent. It's meant to anchor us to something transcendent that I think supplies buoyancy for us in the wilderness. In other words, if, if you want to be able to rise above the feelings of futility that plague our lives in the wilderness, we need to remember who we are and what we're here for. Just because we're wilderness wanderers doesn't mean we are valueless or purposeless. Let me read it for you. Exodus 19. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. 
for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Here's what we're doing. Wilderness wanderers. Here's what God does in these verses. Word for them then is a word for us today. As wilderness wanderers, we're gonna look at who we are and what we're here for. Who we are and what we're here for. First, who we are. Now just a bit of context. Israel has crossed the Red Sea, right? We've been tracking their journey. They've been through the wilderness and up until this point in the story, now they come to the base of Mount Sinai. There's a transition that happens here from movement to staying put. It happens here. In Exodus 19, from movement to staying put. Israel is going to be at the base of Mount Sinai for the better part of a year now. Now, let me pause here. Think about this in context. They have been in almost constant motion and movement since coming out of Egypt. We've tracked that. The fact that God keeps them here for a year is significant. It's as if he's huddling them up at this point in their journey, huddling them up, pushing the reset button, and trying to establish a new foundation for them. What he's about to do is meant to be transformative in their self-perception, how they see themselves. Who are you, Israel, and what are you here for? So Moses goes up the mountain, God speaks, tells Moses what the message is that he wants them to deliver. You get it in verse four, you yourselves, this is God speaking, have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now it might seem like benign backfiller, but what God says here is significant. I could imagine a snarky Israelite responding to this saying, well, God, isn't that a bit of an exaggeration? You carried us out? We had to walk sometimes run. And this was not, by the way, a graceful flight through the air with the wind beneath our wings. We had to endure the stress of a pursuing military. And by the way, God, walking through the Red Sea, staring at an intimidating wall of water, what's up with that? You carried us out? Maybe it's not fair to say, God, that you carried us out. I I don't know. Maybe some would have thought this. The snarky Israelite thinking to themselves, really? This is... How you see this? But that's the point. God's the one speaking. He's interpreting their experience. (laughs) It's meant to be humbling. This is God's interpretation of the Exodus event. He's interpreting for them what just took place. And in God's interpretation of the Exodus event, how active was Israel? Not very In God's interpretation of the Exodus event, Israel's portrayed as completely passive. God brought down judgment on the Egyptians. God parted the Red Sea. God freed them. God redeemed them. God saved them. Now, it's important to remember that in this point in the story, Israel has not been given the Ten Commandments. In other words, Israel has not lifted a finger to merit the salvation they have now experienced. The law is still forthcoming. But getting the order right is critically important to understanding who we are as Christians. Biblical Christianity is salvation by grace first, then obedience. This is radical because it's completely unique among world religions. Salvation by grace first, then obedience. This is completely unique among world religions. All the major world religions agree on two things. Two things. First, they all acknowledge that life is not the way it's supposed to be or can be conceived of. And second, they all offer some sort of ideal world or life. That's where the similarities end. Whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, they all have a model that says, I live right, I do right, then I'm accepted and blessed. Do you know where else you find that motto? Pretty much in every human heart. Kind of hardwired to think that way. 
In fact, I would argue there's something inside us that causes us to think that way. If I live right and I do right, then I get accepted and blessed. You evaluate yourself this way, you judge others this way, you author your own law that exists within your own consciousness, and when, when others abide by it, you bless them, but when they fail, you curse them. So along comes the gospel already in the Old Testament, and it flips everything around. God comes to Israel and says, I have fully saved you, I have fully accepted you, I have fully blessed you, now obey. Because the order is salvation first, then obedience, we learn something about the law, actually. We learn that one of the purposes of the law can't be to get you to heaven. Or to get God to love you. Or to get God to bless you. That's not the purpose of the law. God redeems us, he saves us, he blesses us before there's ever a law. Now I will say, I, I bet there are still some in this room who are struggling to get this order correct. And it is messing with your identity. It's messing with your self-perception. You think salvation hinges on putting together a moral performance that will get God to give you the thumbs up. But that's backwards. It's upside down. And I know what the result of that is. When you lay your head on the pillow at night, you're a mess inside because you don't know if you've been good enough. You're plagued by fear and insecurity over where you stand with God. Why? Because you've got the order wrong. The order is not, I do right, live right, then God will save me. It's salvation by grace first, then obedience. So here's a suggestion. Stop Take a deep breath and talk to God. And I would say, pray this verse back to him. Say to him, God, carry me on eagle's wings to yourself. Carry me on eagle's wings to yourself. Free me, redeem me, save me. If you've already done that, don't move past that. Continue to live in it. This is the core of your identity. This is the core of your self-perception. Listen, Folks, you're not in the wilderness because God has condemned you. Do you realize you're in the wilderness because God has saved you? You're not in the wilderness because God's condemned you. You're in the wilderness because God has saved you. Who are you? Who am I? You're the recipient of God's mercy, grace, love, blessing, rescuing, redemption, and salvation. That's who you are. You're not simply a wilderness wanderer. You're more loved, valued, and cherished than you ever dreamed possible. That's who you are. Before you're anything else, before you're anything else, that's who you are. The late um, NFL football player Demarius Thomas' mother was arrested and sent to prison when he was just 11. He writes, at that time, at the time, my father was in the military. My mother and stepfather and grandmother were locked up. From that day on, I was basically an orphan. I came home from school that day and I thought, where do I go now? Some of you know his story. He eventually made it through high school, college, became a standout wide receiver. But listen to how he describes what helped him. He's living in his own wilderness. Listen to how he describes what helped him. He writes this, people think orphans are kids whose parents have died, but 80% of orphans in the world have at least one parent who is alive somewhere. There are millions of kids just like me all across the U.S. and hundreds of millions all over the world. We rely on the kindness and the couches of others to get us through the day. I had multiple high school coaches who looked out for me, multiple college coaches Deacons, pastors, aunties, uncles, friends. If even one of those people had, not let, had let me slip, would you even know my name? Maybe not. I talk to a lot of kids who have parents in prison or who left them when they were young for one reason or another. I know the anger, the pain, the fear, especially the loneliness. They just want somebody to say, I care about you. But that doesn't happen enough, so they get into trouble. And then he says this, as men, as athletes especially, 
we don't like to talk about love. We talk about brotherhood and all that, but not love. But it's the most important thing in a child's life. More important than the kind of school you go to or what neighborhood you live in, or even if you grow up around drugs and violence. And he finished saying this. He said, if you are loved, you'll make it out. If you are loved, you'll make it out. I think it's one of the things that the Lord's trying to impress upon the people of Israel. It's one of the things he's trying to impress upon us as Christians. If you are loved, you're going to make it out. You're going to get through it. So as wilderness wanderers, first and foremost, we have to remember who we are. Do you know who you are? You are more loved, valued, and cherished than you ever dreamed possible. Before you're anything else, that's who you are. Second, what we're here for. When the Lord saves us by grace and leads us into the wilderness, he does so with purpose. So we actually have a mission. Now, the foundation is who we are. Who am I? I'm the recipient of God's mercy, grace, blessing, rescuing, redemption. I'm more loved, valued, cherished than I ever thought possible. That's who I am. Once we get that established, then we can talk about what our mission is in the wilderness. And God does give it to them. He gives them a purpose in the wilderness. Let me show it to you. Verse four, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you just speak to the Israelites. So in addition to being Israel's mission statement, these verses also serve, by the way, as a preface to the Ten Commandments. God is going to give them the Ten Commandments in the next chapter. So these verses preface them, and together they're showing us the role that this law will have in Israel's collective life. The law is, in a way, their mission statement. But it doesn't just give them something to do. This is not about keeping them busy. By doing it, by performing it, they also become something. There are three terms that God uses to describe the kind of effect the law is designed to have in their lives. Three, three, three terms. Three terms are treasure possession, kingdom of priests, holy nation. By the way, also repeated in the book of First Timothy, first, excuse me, First Peter, which is a book about wilderness wandering. We looked at this a year ago, two years ago, whatever it was, Christians as exiles, Christians as wilderness wanderers. Interesting that Peter picks up this same language from here to write to these Christians who are exiles. These are the three terms. Each of these labels points towards a mission we have in the wilderness, a purpose in the wilderness. Let me show them to you. The first purpose is to commune with God. This is from this term treasured possession. Let me explain this. So the first effect the Ten Commandments are to have in Israel's life is to make them God's treasured possession. This is a very interesting term. It refers to a king's personal treasure, and we need to understand that against the backdrop of absolutist monarchies of Israel's day. In those monarchies, the king was the theoretical owner of everything in the kingdom. The toy playset you got in your backyard, you don't own that. That belongs to the king, right? The car you drive doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the king, right? You name it, belongs to the king. Absolutist monarchies. The king is the owner of everything. Now, within this total ownership, he might gather together and lay aside things that he specially prized in a unique way. That was his choice, personal treasure. That is what this means. Out of everything he's got, he might say, that, 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 that is my special possession. I still own everything else, but this stuff right here is particularly important to me. And that's the language that is used here. Exodus 19, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. You got those phrases, among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. This is intensifying the value of his treasured possession. So listen, this is not a God who's desperate for some friends. 
Huh? Or who likes us because he needs us. No, he's got everything. He's got everything. You name it, he's got it. Grand Canyon, Mount Everest, Caribbean Sea, volcanoes, oceans, beaches, all the peoples in some way are his. He's got it all. He needs nothing. But of all he has, God looks at his people and he says, you, you, out of everything I have, you are my treasured possession. Obedience, holiness is meant to be a response to salvation. God doesn't wait until Israel reaches a certain degree of holiness before he saves them from the Egyptians. He saves them first. Salvation first, then obedience. But listen, but listen, we've got to account for the way the language is written. Obedience and holiness are also meant to form us into God's treasured possession. I think there is something to be said for the role that holiness and obedience play in us experiencing God as if we really are his treasured possession. Even though we're saved by grace, we get stuck in sinful habits, habits that are often subtle, and when that happens, we may not experience God as if we really are his treasured possession. Theologians throughout the centuries have noted the difference between union with God and communion with God. Union with God and communion with God. Union with God is by grace through faith. It never changes. It's unalterable. Communion with God can change. It's possible for believers to have more or less of God's favor. It's like marriage. Think about marriage. You can't be more or less married. You can't be more or less married. You're married. That's union. Hmm? That's union. But you can have a stronger or weaker marriage. That's communion. God gives them the law as a means of grace to experiencing their treasured possessionship. Listen to it again. Now, if you obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Did you know that Jesus taught something similar? John 14, Jesus says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 15, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. You see it? Obedience, holiness is not not the means of our salvation. We're saved by grace. But God God does put out there obedience, holiness as a means to experiencing our treasured possessionship. Thomas Goodwin in the 17th century had a good way of illustrating this. He, uh, he wrote that one day he saw a father and a son walking along the street. And suddenly the father swept the son up into his arms and he hugged him. He kissed him, told the boy he loved him. And after a minute, he put the boy back down. And he writes, was the little boy more of a son in the father's arms than he was down on the street? No. No. Objectively and legally, there was no difference. But subjectively and experientially, there was all the difference in the world. In the father's arms, the boy was experiencing his sonship. God gave Israel the law so that they would experience their sonship that they would experience their union with him, that they would experience their treasured possessionship. Second, our first mission is to commune with God. Second is to project God's likeness to the world. Project God's likeness to the world. You see this in the label kingdom of priests. Now, when when God talks about kingdom of priests, he's referring to the Israelite priests that served in the tabernacle and temple, not necessarily our modern understanding of what a priest is. Israel as a whole, he's saying, was to serve a priestly function similar to the priests in the tabernacle. The priests represented the Lord. Aaron, chief priest, had garments that were made of the same material as the curtain 
of the most holy place. The most holy place was where the Lord powerfully and magnificently manifested his presence. This suggests that Aaron represented the Lord's presence. He projected God to the people. The word glory is used in Exodus only of the Lord with the significant exception of Aaron's garments. In this sense, then, Aaron bore God's glory to the people. They themselves could not go into the most holy place to witness God's glory, but they could see Aaron and witness God's glory there. So the individual priest displayed God's glory to the people. He represented God to the people. But here, God's call is for Israel, the entire people of Israel, to be a kingdom of priests. Hmm. They all would represent God. They all would represent God. To whom? To each other, to the world. Did you know that you are God's representative in the world? This is part of your mission as a redeemed follower of Jesus Christ? To represent God everywhere you go. If the law is the very outworking and essence of God's character, and Israel was to embody that, then being in God's image isn't just a statement of human dignity, it also calls to action. It's a mission statement. So as God's people live out the law, they manifest the presence of God. They image God. So the law shows us who we were made to be, the image of God in the world. You know, the, one of the clearest ways to find this, to see this in the New Testament, are the virtue and vice lists. How many are there? There's a bunch of them. Virtue and vice lists. What are they there for? Why talk about this? Because as the unique people of God, you have a, you have a mission, a lofty mission, a noble mission. You've been redeemed to represent God to each other in the world. Third is to form a unique community, a holy nation. God says here that one of the purposes of the law and obedience to it is to make Israel a holy nation. That is, Israel was to reflect God's distinctive character to each other in the world. Now, as the preface to the Ten Commandments, we can see that the Ten Commandments were given to mold Israel into a radically new community, a community the likes of which the world had not seen. So if the Ten Commandments were to mold Israel into a holy nation, a radically new community, one aspect that we see is that a holy nation, this radically new community, is God-focused, God-centric, God-loving. The first four commandments of the Ten are concerned with Israel's relationship to God. It is God-centric. It is God-focused. It is God-loving. So I can extrapolate from that and say, Christian, no group of people ought to be talking more about the Lord than we do. No group of people ought to be saturated in the word of God more than we are. No group of people ought to be more consumed with honoring the Lord in thought, word, and deed than us. There are reasons that we put in our journals the phrase, Jesus obsessed. There's a reason we do that. It's meant to characterize this group. You should not be able to go to another community of people and find one that's more like that than we are. But a second aspect to this holy nation is in the six commandments that follow the first four. They demonstrate beauty in their relationships with each other because the final six commandments are all about what loving your neighbor looks like. So there's a Jesus obsession about us, it's what should characterize us in the wilderness, God-centric, God-focused, God-loving, God-obsessed, but then also we're meant to be a community that treats each other in unique ways. Jesus talked about this in John 13. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Everyone will know we are Christians by our love for one another. In other words, we're talking about the beauty of the church community. We've got some gardening to do 
in our church and our relationships with one another. This is part of our mission in the wilderness. Because we're meant to be a very unique community. We've got a God-centricness to us. You can't be found anywhere else. But the way in which the, way in which the network and, and, and the relationships work within the church is meant to be different, meant to be unique. Like, you can't find this sort of thing anywhere else kind of unique. Gina Welch wrote a book a few years ago entitled In the Land of Believers, An Outsider's Extraordinary Journey into the Heart of the Evangelical Church. Gina describes herself as a secular Jew who was raised by a single mother in Berkeley, California. Her father was a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party. She received her degree from Yale University and at the age of 10 declared herself to be, quote, a hardened little atheist, end quote, at the age of 10. Well, in her young adult years, she had a curiosity about Christians and Christianity that led her to doing something most of us would find unethical. She faked becoming a Christian, going through the emotions of getting baptized and all, so she could embed herself in a church and study us, similar to what a National Geographic researcher might do with a herd of animals. She carried on this charade for two years. She went on missions trips. Yes, she even led people to the Lord. And then she wrote a book about it, which became a bestseller. And to be quite honest, it's one of the best books I've read in the last 12 years. There are so many honest observations she makes about churches and Christians that deserve some reflection. But one of the lasting impacts her experience in the church had on her was the way in which the people treated each other in the church that she was a part of. Here's what she said. She said, the God-originated goodness created an ecosystem of trust, interdependence, and freedom with favor trading, the likes of which I had never before experienced. Mostly the climate in this ecosystem made living easier. And she goes on to detail what she means by this, lists the ways in which these Christians in this church would care for each other. And she makes careful, uh, pays careful attention to noting the fact that she'd never seen anything like this before. This ecosystem, as she puts it, was unique. Maybe that's what Jesus was saying. By this, by this ecosystem that's created in this Jesus-obsessed culture, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. How we treat each other in the church is evangelistically powerful. Now, I don't think she became a believer from this, but I will tell you, in her closing reflections in the book, the way in which this community functioned, the relationships with one another, was something that was very unique to her. She'd not seen anything like it. Maybe the way in which we treat each other is evangelistically powerful. She experienced something in the church she'd never before experienced outside the church. Can we say that that's true of us? Since this is what the Lord does with Israel at this juncture in the story is to push the pause button to stop the movement, to huddle them up, to push the reset button and say, listen, we've got to get some things straight. You don't know who you are and you don't know what you're here for, so I need to clarify that for you. That's what I want this message to do. We're huddling up. You've been frantic with your activity throughout the summer, maybe your lives. I want to push the pause button, hit the reset button, huddle us up and say, okay, who are we? What are we here for? Who are we and what are we here for? You're not in the wilderness because God has condemned you. You're in the wilderness because God has saved you. Who are you? You are the recipient of God's mercy, grace, love, blessing, rescuing, redemption, and salvation. You're not simply a wilderness wanderer. You are more loved, valued, and cherished than you ever dreamed possible. Before you're anything else, 
anything else before you are a spouse, a husband, a wife, a parent, a worker, a church attender, a church member, before you're anything else, that's who you are, Christian. Additionally, you're not in the wilderness to wander this for no reason. The wilderness is a place where God invites us to commune with him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to experience your treasured possessionship. The wilderness is a place where we represent God to the world and others. There's a God-likeness that's meant to be characteristic of us. And the wilderness is a place where we as a group of redeemed believers form a unique community of people obsessed with Jesus and loving one another in ways that create a community not found anywhere else on the planet. You want to know what life in the wilderness is supposed to be about? That's it. That's who you are, and that's what you're here for. Let's pray. Sometimes I wonder, Lord, if we lose sight of that because of the frantic pace that we're running at. We lose sight of who we are. We forget who we are. We forget that before we're anything else, we are more loved, valued, and cherished than you ever dreamed possible. Lies try to get inside our head and our hearts that tell us we're nothing. You're nothing. So we thank you for the reminder, the bold statement, that simply isn't true. Before we're anything else, we are the recipients of your mercy, your grace, your love, your salvation. So Lord, I pray that you teach us to rest in that first. And Lord, you save us, you bring us into the wilderness, you, you give us purpose. You want us to commune with you. You don't send us out into the wilderness and wait at the edge of it and watch what unfolds. No, you come with us. Because there's something you're after. Something you're after that's better than fixing circumstances. You want us to know you. Perhaps the wilderness is the best place for us to learn to know you. And Lord, we know that you've commissioned us to be a unique community of people who project you to others, to the world, who are formed into a community that is utterly unique. And I pray that that would be true of Alliance Bible Church. We want to bear your likeness in everything we think and everything we do and everything we say. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to remember the gospel story. This is it. We have been accepted through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and transformed into a new people. We worship you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen.